many people roll in and then yep. if, if, if we find that uh, not, we're not getting a ton of uh, people come in we could still do our q a yeah it's okay because people probably had the time booked last week when the tech went down for us mm, so to see oh. Oh, I have another question. You can see when people are there, can't you? Tell me if yeah, yeah. Um, tell me when I have to be professional or if I don't have to be professional. <laughs> well, it's going to be uh, recorded anyway, so yeah, that's it. You can be a professional. What <laughs> this position you'd like to inhabit? Um, I'm not joining at the moment, but I can. I mean, I can start, and then people will roll in, or they won't. That's fine. Yeah, I can. I can imagine people because. Asking questions is quite a nerve-wracking thing to do on a live thing anyway, isn't it? So turning up yeah. just to ask questions live would be really, you'd have to be really, really brave to do that. Right, yeah. I've got questions, I can just be asked questions. It's, uh, yeah, and I think it's challenging to kind of take them apart from the live event, so it's not so much responses, as you have to keep it in your mind and then... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This container then. <laughs> no, more often people just sort of want to say something in response to what they've heard. It's not necessarily a question, is it? It's just like a talk more about this thing. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll just uh, I'll start the session and people can watch okay. it in, in um, retrospect. Uh, so, hi everyone who is watching this recording. Um, <laughs> my name is Valenza. Um, I work. Uh, at Centoc, we are a charity based in South London, and our aim is to improve uh, social and emotional outcomes for children and young people with additional needs, um, particularly autism and ADHD and their families. And this, our Sun Explain series, is an attempt to uh, move the conversation forward in the field of SEN and and to have sort of wider dialogues. Um, so. Today we are having the Q and A portion with Joanna Grace, who is a uh, sensory engagement specialist who spoke last week, this week, um, on capacity and context. Um, so, so yes, um, happy to have you here, Joanna. Um, so I'll begin by asking <laughs> the number of questions I asked. Uh, I, I wrote, I jotted down here. So, um. I was I was really struck uh, when you mentioned uh, that for you um, um, you hope sort of when people meet you that you don't know, hope, hope uh, you, they don't see that you're autistic and that sort of masking for you is a um, it, it, it it's a skill right and I thought that was quite profound because I I think um, looking at uh, current masking research it kind of focuses on uh, this capacity as a coping mechanism, um, but it doesn't necessarily provide solutions for um, you know the autistic community, the neurodiverse community that is masking. Um, in other words, the underlying need to mask is not addressed. Um, and then sort of how that ties into the defi deficit-based narratives. Uh, that's yeah. Really um, so I just thought the question that I might pull from from those sort of um, those observations is just um, where do you think um, autism research should be focused or headed in a way that would uh, promote um, autistic well-being? I think that's a really interesting one. I said I hope that people don't know that I'm autistic, but I also wear clothes that say 
I am autistic and I've got a whole load of face masks now that have the infinity logo on. So it's not that I'm ashamed to be autistic. I'm very happy for people to know that I'm autistic. I'm just also quite proud of the skill that I learned all these years of looking not autistic. So I'm sort of proud of the ability to be in stealth mode, but not ashamed of the neurodiversity that I am an example of. Um, the the reason that people mask is because we have these deficit narratives surrounding us and we are told we're not supposed to be this thing and we should be another thing. So the wonderful thing that autism research could do is look at the autistic experience and learn a bit more about these brains. Not And obviously research has looked a lot of our brain, at our brains and how we do things, but it's all been based on that deficit narrative. How do we fix these people? How can we make them behave in a different way? How can we normalize these people? Whereas if you explored a bit more what our brains are good at, um, how you can support us in things that we struggle with, then you would be releasing capacity and exposing capacity. And even just some, some research into how we frame these things would be good because a lot of the things are, it's like I was saying in the talk, isn't it? They're the same thing that is a strength in one context is a weakness in another. So it's not necessarily about saying that we don't have weaknesses. It's just about flipping that narrative and presenting it in another way. Mm, yeah, that's really that's really important. I think I was reading an article um, the other day that was kind of focused on um, <clears throat> participation in autism research and how um, oftentimes uh, this this sort of artistic participant in particular felt um, like they were a specimen that you know the social context for the way they were was not considered like the fact that. Um, like I think you touched on it is the uh, you touched on that study that mentioned quality of life for autistic people and how there's this really uh, ridiculous correlation that autism causes low quality of life and so it's this failure to see autistic people as within their environment as with everyone else as with ever every other social identity or identity right um, so I thought there um, a question that I had is how do we not only is, is it important, I think, to build inclusive research and accessible accessible kinds of research, but how do we, I guess, build sensitivity around bias, um, whether it's um, designing research studies or just in, in contexts like school or um, just everywhere? I mean, how do we begin to have that conversation of breaking down? Um, it's an interesting one. I have seen good and bad examples of autistic participation in research or um, <laughs> I'm not going to name, but a well-known organisation um, who became aware that in order to represent autistic people, you should have some autistic people be a part of your group and have maybe um, adopted some autistic people who aren't able to understand necessarily what's going on within that organization so people who've got learning difficulties as well as autism mm. but they're sort of there to rubber stamp stuff so it's like we as an organization of neurotypical people have decided this thing and this autistic person said it was okay and so that's fine and then it, they can defend themselves from the challenge that they don't have autistic representation because they go no no look we've got you know Johnny here and he's autistic and he he likes us that's not really autistic participation it's great that they recognize that they're supposed to have Johnny there but it's a bit more than that isn't it and then autistic participation in research. I am an autistic and I have participated in research. I was a part of a couple of studies that were looking into autistic experiences of lockdown. And it's interesting to see how you're approached by those researchers because they'll do a call out. We, you know, we want autistic people to take part. And obviously I'm somebody who faces very few barriers to accessing things. Um, I've got the communication skills that I'm using with you here, which are all right, but I tend to stop talking and surprise people I talk a lot and then I just stop with no warning which is tricky when you're interviewing me um but some of those people say here you go um take part in our research 
pick a box and we will phone you on the time of day that you pick. Mm. And you're like, I don't want to be phoned. I can't communicate with you on the phone. Well, I can try, but it would be an incredibly glitchy conversation. Whereas other people will approach you and go, we're doing the study. We want to ask you about these things. How is it best? You know, would you prefer to do this by email, by Zoom, on the phone? That's your being more inclined. Both studies are including autistics. Both studies are asking autistics for their experience. The best option is to have, well, not necessarily the best option, but that my favorite option would be to have the autistic led groups so that it's not other people including and the reason I hesitated is I was, because the best person to do the job should be the person who is best at the job but it's with all these bias narratives isn't it it's like um positively selecting um ethnic minority um election candidates or female election candidates because there is a pre-existing bias doing something to positively weight that to nudge it back is helpful but what we're aiming for is at the end of the day the person who's best for the job gets the job but we're starting from such a non-level playing field that to put that out there now would be very naive in the same way that it would be um naive to say oh you know well if the black businessman is the best then he will get the best position you're like no there's a lot of stuff that's put him at a not equal footing beforehand mm. how we weight that how we shift that bias ah, those are massive questions for somebody who is not a sensory engagement specialist for somebody who is a bias specialist but it's things like being aware that the bias exists isn't it just being mm. honest about it and having mm. representation and role models mm. and I, I think you mentioned uh you you outlined it really well in saying um taking every person as an ex expert in their own experiences so i think it's really like i guess taking every opportunity to admit the limits of your own knowledge on that yeah. you know this person's experience so i think that's for that to be a starting point i think is a really good one in, in terms of recognizing and being sensitive to biases we may not even know we have um so that's a that's a really interesting one um let me see and i see a few people have joined us so welcome um if you I have questions for joanna uh feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll read them out um if you don't i will go ahead with a few questions i've i've uh, put together um so if you take a few moments and put those in the chat um uh, that would be great um i guess i'll go ahead with the next question um uh, Another another sort of uh, something that caught my interest was um, how environment is a, is can communicate a child's needs and preferences. So using environment um, to uh, bring something out. Um, so a quiet corner and a sensory corner could show you um, sort of differences in experience and need. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question I had as a follow up might be. How do we ensure, I guess, in school settings um, across all ages, that children and young people get this chance at participation? So they get a chance to identify their needs and preferences. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting one with regards to neurodivergent young people. So I like to, on training days, I quite often use Dunn's model of sensory processing disorder as a good sort of broad brush overview. And obviously it's much more complicated and nuanced, and, but as a, as a broad model, it's really good because um, she looks at having a high threshold and a low threshold sensory experience and being an active responder or a passive responder. To, to your experience. So you measure your um, threshold against the just general everyday world. And we would hope that we exist within a threshold that means that the everyday world is accessible to us. But we all have an upper limit, something that we find too stimulating. And we all would have a lower limit of something that's just boring and dull and we disengage from. And we hope that our day-to-day -day life falls within that. If you have... Um, if you have a high, a high tolerance, um, a high threshold, then the everyday world might fall below that window and so be a bit not interesting to you. So the everyday world would be like being in a sensory deprivation tank. There's just like nothing going on and no, it's not very interesting. And if you have a low threshold, then the everyday world might fall above it and it would be too much. So um, that would be like 
being in a really loud nightclub with all the lights going and it would just be too much for you and um, we all have these thresholds and they shift depending on how we're feeling like if you're ill the everyday world can feel like the nightclub experience and if you're super pumped then you want more like let's go somewhere let's do a thing let's get more um yeah. so we all shift and we shift as we age and we shift depending on our hormone changes and all of this but we broadly have these thresholds and active responders are people who will actively do something to adjust so in a situation where they've got a low threshold and the everyday world is too much for them they will do something to block out that stimulation so they might close their eyes they might shut their ears um some people will bang their heads because it's like a white out experience mm -hmm. um but they do something that looks atypical so you spot them mm -hmm. if you're a passive responder and the everyday world is too much for you you won't do something you'll you're just kind of trying to stick it out. So you won't be particularly noticeable. You might look a bit uncomfortable or seem a bit distracted because you're trying to deal with the like the nightclub that's happening around you. But because you're not overtly doing something, you're hard to spot. And the same with the low threshold people. If you've got, which way around am I? High threshold. If the everyday world is like the sensory deprivation tank, the active responder is going to do something to get more stimulation. They're going to, you know, shake stuff or move around and look at, you know, go, go, go. You're going to notice them because they do this stuff. And if you've got a low, th I've forgotten where I am on my thresholds, but if the everyday world is the sensory deprivation tank to you and you've got a passive response, you're just going to seem a bit like lackluster, a bit, uh, bit out of it, a bit, dis you know, the child that somebody would describe as needing a kick up the backside, you know, needs to light a rocket under them, just a bit, because uh, uh, nothing's going on for you. Yeah. And of those children in your sort of average classroom of 30 kids, you will spot the active responders because they stand out. But the passive responders need just as much support and input. And so that thing that I said about the environment, because when I talk about that in front of teachers, they'll go, well, how do I know which ones are the passive responders? And if you set out the environment or if you you don't have to set out like a test environment, you just have to notice like at playtime, do they stand in the corner in a little quiet place or are they running around and getting everything out of that, you know, sensation there as possible? And you can spot where people's needs are depending on that environmental context. Mm -hmm. But of course, as we get older we all learn masking and we all pick up coping strategies and we manage the things in our but some of us can't manage and again you'll spot us those are really easy spots um but for a lot of people we are coping with an enormous amount we are dealing with the noise we are dealing with the visual stimulation around us we are dealing with all of this and we're doing it it's fine we're doing it and we're doing our school work and it's great but just imagine how much better we could be how much more schoolwork we could do for you how much more expressive we could be if we didn't have to do the coping and that was one of the things that really shocked me about my experience of lockdown is I've been doing this um coping happily for decades I didn't I knew I was doing it but I didn't realize how much and when lockdown took it away and I no longer had to do all those things my capacity rocketed I, I was like superhuman I can I can right. write you a book I can do you a thing I can raise a baby and do all this stuff I could do it all because all that energy that I was using I am about to have to start using again and I'm sort of looking at the closing of lockdown with a like it's lovely it's going to be lovely to be able to be out in the world and see people again but I'm aware now of what what I'm going to have to pay to do that mm. right yeah, that will feed into my next question. Uh, but something I wanted to note from what you just said is um, almost like this ubiquitous expectation that I get, that I witness sometimes when I when I come across school staff like Senkos. This attitude from schools is like, well, we're all coping. Um, and this is something we all have to do and sort of get over it. And, you know, and, and I don't, just based on what you said and what, what I see, you know, when, when a child is enabled with their capacity in the right context, coping is just not weak. Coping, I think, points to something sort of out of sync, out of balance. Um, yeah. So I we like can, that. We can, but why Why should we have to? Yeah. It's been, I've, I've had over the last two months, I, I would say, 
five families contact me who have daughters who would be between sort of the ages of nine and 12 who are autistic and who have expressed suicidal thoughts mm. at the sort of what they are going to have to do next. And I wonder perhaps if those little girls are experiencing a sort of similar thing to me, but aren't able to articulate it, aren't mm. able to put their finger on it. They're just feeling it in mm. that all of this is coming back. And it's, it's almost as if, all those skills, all those coping strategies were muscles that we used to own that have atrophied, like yeah. astronauts coming back to Earth. And the thought of doing it again just seems impossible. And so in their child expression of it, they're looking at what's coming next and going, I can't do that. Right. And if that's what I'm being told life is, I can't, I can't do that. Yeah. So my only other option is not not life and it's not a desire to die it's not somebody who's not enjoying life and not wanting to be alive it's just that wonderful binary brain that we have that goes well it's this or this and it does that in all situations and in some situations it's really useful but in this one where my only option for next is something I know I can't do because my muscles are wasted away and I can't do this then my other option is is that and I think I, I was talking, I'm talking very, you know, exploring with some of these parents and we are all programmed to expect that we go to school and we do these things. And you sort of, one one lady said, I'm not sure that her time for education is now. And you're like, oh, what an amazing thought. You're like, maybe she could, because she's perfectly capable of learning that stuff. She could, she could learn it later when she's relaxed and she knows who she is and she's confident in herself, you give her the whole primary education, she'd do it in six months, she'd be fine. But just imagine if you didn't have to. My first job that I got when I um, graduated from my degree was as a teaching assistant in a, special, um, in a secondary school. And I remember vividly watching one day when um, a, a girl in year nine who came from a very troubled background, but um, full of character loads of chutzpah all the energy and like this the life that she had was horrific but her strength of being was phenomenal and she'd got red hair and she was just a little firecracker and I saw her and we'd been told we'd we'd all like it'd been radioed around school watch out because we think she's going to truant she's good and I saw her legging it across the school field and I didn't report her I just watched her run away um, she, I knew where she was going. I wasn't, you know, she wasn't going to play in traffic. She was just running home. Um, but I remember watching and thinking, God, I wish I'd known when I was at school that you could just run away because my brain follows the rules and I knew that it wasn't allowed. So I was always trapped at school and I was in prison at school. And the thought that you could just leave was amazing. And what if somebody said, hey, you, you don't have to go to school. We can do it in a different way or we can do it in a different place. You know, there's amazing settings that have, you know, classes of 12 children or places like Limford Grange that are set up with an understanding where children like small me can go to school and they don't have to cope with going to school. They can just go to school. Um, yeah, it's... um. I think, and it's. I think perhaps sometimes we miss that imagine that that opportunity to imagine um, as educators and as I guess in in these positions where we can have this impact on on the child. We we miss this kind of like maybe we just haven't designed society to correspond to what it could be. But maybe that's something we have to do is sort of start imagining better. Yeah, it's daydream well, stuff, isn't it? Yeah, but. It, uh, I guess that's what it takes if we want to imagine a better, um, more uh, inclusive, sort of accessible spaces for our children. We have to start imagining, okay, uh, let, let's try it out. Let's try different things out. Um, of course, it's not always, it's, that's easy to say and hard to do. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, like we mentioned before, this idea, like, um, I know masking research has, has taken a turn to not only look at coping, um, uh, 
looking at as a coping mechanism, but looking at, uh, like you say, it's like turning the onus on uh, the context that that gives rise to that coping. So the you know the the trauma that a child has to go through, and I think as we shed light on these experiences, I think we'll we'll be able to imagine perhaps uh, better better environments, better context. I, I think it's relevant that you use the word trauma there because it is very easy to traumatize children because trauma is a very specific thing in the brain. It's how um, it it's not necessarily linked to how severe an experience is. Two people can have the same experience and one person be traumatized and one person not. The description of trauma is how that experience goes down in, in your memory. And if you are not traumatized, you can have a really horrific experience and it goes into your memory and it is part of your past. It's part of the story that is you, but it's not present. If you're traumatized, it stays in your present and you are trapped in that moment and you respond to the world around you as if that's still going and it's the difference is the person's ability to act in response to whatever was happening so if something terrible happens to you but you are in some way able to act in response to that you are less likely to be traumatized than somebody who can act in response and children have very little power so there is very little that they can do to act in response to stuff yeah. so it's very easy to traumatize children and they can be traumatized by seemingly small deal stuff and a lot of autistic people and I'm sure a lot of neurotypical people too can be traumatized by experiences that happen at school and to escape that would be amazing. I'm a part of a, a Facebook group that was set up by um, somebody who was looking to support neurodivergent children um, with coping with school and we were all asked to submit a film that said coping tips for how we coped with school and I didn't respond to the request because I couldn't think of any and then they prompted me and said oh you know we'd really like your involvement and I I would love to be involved I didn't I I have none I had no coping strategies for school all that happened was that it finished <laughs> that's it yeah. that's all I can tell you that it ends and that's such yeah. a grim message to be passing on to children and Yes, I got through it and I got good. I got the best grades in my year. I, you know, I was a success. But I, if I hadn't had to do that, you know, I definitely wouldn't wish that. I, I don't wish to change my experience because I'm happy with who I am and where I am and I am accepting of that. But if you if you had a child who was me now I would wish to change her experience because it's still it's still very relevant to my present day the experiences that would seemingly be mundane at school yeah yeah um yeah and it's and it's interesting to think about trauma as this thing we we can't separate from identity over time but but to remove traumas you know up you know experiences that give rise to trauma for uh for our kids is it's obviously the best outcome and um yeah. we had um holly bridges on she's an australian therapist and researcher and uh she uh and i'm, I'm sure there's different approaches with different names everywhere but it's the polyvagal theory and the idea is oh that yeah the, yeah. the idea is that you know before we even realize it before we're even aware our body our bodies create responses and coping like coping mechanisms to our environment and um for a lot of children and young people they're um as a result sort of their brain and body um that communication is is uh disconnected and so going through life think, thinking life is a certain way and i have to adapt and cope and that's just it and it's really thinking um my body's using these coping mechanisms from a previous time that's no longer helping me right now um yeah. and so it's it's I think trauma gives you this thing you have to piece apart after the event um but but again it's like like we're saying it's creating a context where capacity is enabled to obviously uh remove potential for this but um but yeah I think um people are unbel unbelievably resilient but we shouldn't sort of um stop that from doing the work <laughs> of improving those contexts in the first place. <laughs>
Um, but to, to move back, I had a question, um, how you elucidated lockdown um, and how it presented us all with a huge context shift. And so now, you know, the neurotypical population can kind of understand what it's like to be disabled by context. Um, my question is, what do you hope that most people take from their experiences of being disabled and now coming back to being abled again? Well, that's a funny one, isn't it? To link with those coping strategies. A friend of mine said, um, who is neurotypical, uh, said she found the first lockdown extraordinarily difficult that she normally in her life her coping strategies are to you know meet up with friends and have a drink and she relies very heavily on her social skills to support her mental well-being which is interesting for me because I've never heard it said out loud but then you think oh yeah of course that must be what they do <laughs> I'd, like, I'd never considered that um that that might be how I would do it oh yeah see yeah that's a good tip that's a good tip I might borrow it um but when all of her normal strategies were removed from her she she really really struggled but then she began to do and I think it's something we saw we saw people going outside we saw people taking up creative activities she began little craft projects and things like this and she said it was really really hard to do those things because I was feeling so awful at the time she described it she said it was like growing a third limb it was painful as it grew yeah. she said but now I've got it I will have it for the rest of my life so People have developed coping strategies through adversity, and we do get to keep those. You know, these are the fruits of our suffering. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess from a perspective, so aside from, I guess, being betterly abled, um, from a perspective standpoint, do you think, um, I guess, sort of knowing that, um, recognising how, how important context is, I mean, do you hope that, I hope Is that. Understanding I will take us somewhere else. Should, should it? I mean, I, I don't think people will take that unless somebody frames it for them. That's why I'm, you know, that's why I'm saying it. But I'd love to say it somewhere bigger because it would be lovely to be able to sort of say to the world at large, look, you know, when you were in a social setup that didn't suit you, you didn't fare so well, did you? How about we have some different social setups and then we can pick, we can all just pick where we want to be. I, I think it will happen a bit because a lot of companies are not expecting staff to fully return to work. They're going to allow good chunks of staff to remain working from home. And it would be nice to think that those staff can self-select. So possibly we are moving into a future where in the workplace, um, people who are better you know, able to work from the privacy of their own bedroom or something or their living room will have the opportunity to do that without being seen as somehow not being a team player right yeah that's a really good point of this 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 whole reality that we i guess we might be walking into is this self-selection hopefully that would be great yeah it's like the children in the playground thing isn't it wouldn't it be nice yeah. if we got that in the workplace too yeah yeah um let me see what other question. Um, so um, you've mentioned, you, you spoke about a child um, who had a sensory difference and you prefaced it by talking about sort of sensory differences being caused by physiological differences and sometimes uh, gaps in sensory development. Um, and so... I, uh, Sort of taking that to say that intervention should not be treated all the same for every child. Um, so, and these are these are all big questions, but I guess to to prompt a dialogue, um, how do we? I mean, how should we define the value of interventions if every child's coming at us with different contexts, different yeah. logical differences? How do we define and allow a child to kind of participate in what that value is for them? So, like. I yeah that's that's the one what you just said how do you define the value of an intervention you ask what is it the use of this to this child is this child going to gain anything is the purpose of this intervention to make this child look more normal or to be more normal or to fit a social model that we expect is it an intervention that pushes towards a norm or is it an intervention that has some functional value for that child is doing this going to mean that they get to have more fun you know that they get to 
go to more places and do more things or is it just that they will look a bit more normal right. and it's really nice when you see examples of people embracing not looking normal or not being normal because there's like there's a, there's often a lot of pressure on getting people to use spoken language mm. and I understand where that comes from from an emotional point because I'm a mummy and I want to hear my children I want to hear my children say I love you I, I don't want to see them type it but why right. you know because yeah, the yeah. important thing is that they love me isn't it it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how it's said so why does it matter so much to me that they say it and if I'm pushing pushing and pushing for spoken language of course of course that's mm. useful of course that's going to benefit the child because they're going to be able to walk into a shop and say please can I have an ice cream yeah. um it makes it easy they're they're avenues of the world the other communications are there and it's a it's a balance isn't it because a lot of the interventions, you'd have a very end point that's going to have value, but there's a price to pay as you get there. Right. And sometimes um, I'm def I'm, I'm keep going back to vocal communication and autism because it's one of these ones where it, you, like, you might have somebody with a different learning disability who's struggling to articulate sound. So, for example, lots of people who have Down syndrome because of the low muscle tone in their mouth, struggle to articulate the words properly. So might need speech and language therapy to learn to shape the words, to use the words, to use spoken language. But you get autistic children who are just not talking, who then suddenly go, oh, please can I have a cup of tea? And it's not the same stepping stones that they need. They might need just the sort of, the moment of calm, the relaxed situation, the lack of pressure that enables them to express themselves. And I'm somebody who talks a lot, but there are still times in my life when I cannot produce language. Mm -hmm. So there are there are moments in my life when I am nonverbal. And in those positions, I, I don't need to be taught how to make the shapes of words. Right. Or That's I don't need somebody true. coming in getting me to say a letter sound that's not going to get me out of that place any quicker it's a different sort of a thing and mm -hmm. I think understanding that difference and finding a way for that person just to completely be themselves and if that's themselves without talking fine and once they are completely themselves if they want to tack stuff onto it like talking or or other sort of more normal expressions go for it but it would be wonderfully freeing wouldn't it to just see somebody I really like have you seen Estee Clark's work yeah you sent me her video actually she um she Beautiful. did a did a piece for reframing autism um, yeah 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 um I think that's really interesting and it and it definitely points to this I guess well, not confusion but this sort of misdirected benevolence sometimes with interventions is we're so focused on producing an idea of competency. So, you know, being verbal as, as I guess this, this sign that you're competent. And we forget that, um, we forget that everyone we interact with actually has this m momentary changing sense of their own well being, And that, that is a more important, and that should be the first consideration in an in intervention is, how are you how are you doing how is this affecting you is this something you want um, yeah is and I think it's okay to have them next to each other so perhaps having interventions that look at first that priority and then sort of look at here this is an idea of something that might work for you I think work. parents are put under an enormous amount of pressure to be doing something to their child something for their child you know yeah. we want the absolute best for our children and so you are in this world where all these interventions exist and all these therapies exist and all these products that you can buy exist and you would do anything for your child so of course you will seek them all out and you but I wonder if if they weren't there which ones you would have looked for 
because what you would want most for that child is for them to have good self-esteem a sense of who they are and a knowledge of their capacities because then you can play to your strengths can't you and it doesn't it doesn't matter if you don't have strengths in every area if you you only need like one thing that you're good at and you can thrive in life and all of that adjustment from the outside can every time somebody tries to fix you the message that you hear is there's something wrong with me yeah and every time you're you know invited to the therapy or somebody does a thing the background message is there's something wrong with you yeah. and so we can inadvertently end up telling our children you're not you're not good enough like this you need to be better you need to change whereas I'd love to see <laughs> I, I quite often you see the the there's enormous overlaps between gay history and autistic history not, not least in some of the more horrific treatments come from the same set of researchers so people who've um, are famous for trying to cure people of being gay are also famous for trying to cure people of being autistic thank you um but with that masking narrative you have the sort of in the closet narrative of gay people and all those social pressures and expectations to conform to a norm they overlap enormously um and what you would want for a gay person is for them to know from very young that there is such a thing as gay because quite often people grow up knowing that they're not like you know, like they don't like the girls the way the other people like the girls but they don't know what it is that they are you need to know what you are know what that is know that that's a good thing and then be shown how to express it and then you so you go from the in the closet gay person who feels really bad about themselves who struggles with their mental health who feels different to the world around them to the like out and proud super expressive you, you like you want that version for autism you want the whatever that whole and I think it comes from seeing role models knowing your history you know connecting with your community those are the things that if you were looking to provide like therapy for an autistic child that's what you want you want to find the role models the community the history that stuff because that's just fuel that's that's nourishment it's not corrective yeah that's that's beautifully said um yeah and and so often that is absent and um that's you know it's a question i ask working in our charity is uh, usually you know it's it's families coming to us at crisis point and saying, like, I don't have the right support. My child just needs to be supported so they can get to a better place where they feel okay. Yeah. And I think it's not knowing that sort of the side effects of intervention, like you said, it's this reinforcing this deficit model. So I think what we find is uh, it's almost like putting a f putting out this fire. We have to put out this fire first, make sure they have access to this, sort of what they're told is this essential sort of targeted support um but I, again it's i guess it's all about the intention of that intervention and like, like you said it's it's framing it in a way where it's reinforcing a, a, you know positively an identity but it's not negating it um, parents will do yeah. anything anything for their children and it's so frightening when you feel like the world isn't understanding your child and isn't seeing the the beauty and the value of your child and mm. And yeah, you you would do anything, and mm. so it's very natural that we look for the support that's available, and take whatever's there, without necessarily asking those questions. There's some really challenging thoughts, aren't there? There are therapies that will change behaviour. So if you are struggling with somebody expressing the difficulties that they're having in their life through their behaviour you can do a therapy that will stop them producing that behavior and it works and it's been researched and it's proven. And so if you view the problem as the behavior, yes, you can get rid of it with the therapy. If you view the problem as the problem that the person was expressing through their behavior, then all the therapy does is stop them expressing it and leaves the problem there in their lives. And that will have the harmful effect over a much longer term you have to be pragmatic about it as well don't you if you've got somebody who's physically hurting themselves or physically hurting other people you do need that behavior to stop and so we are making 
very difficult choices and it's very easy for me to go oh, you just, like you just need role models and to march down the street and be happy being neurodiverse i i get that the lived experience is quite different yeah so um we'll have that for th food for thought for those watching um um and just a few more questions here um this could kind of i guess tie together all what we're talking about is um how do we begin making um a true inclusion a reality like what would that what does that really look like i mean that's it's a big question but maybe we can give me a magic wand <laughs> <laughs> um, you want me to reinvent education i do this in my head when i'm falling asleep sometimes I think, I think I think it's modular. I think it's community based. I don't think it's a, defined by age. Um, I think you could opt in and out as and when you're ready in life. Um, I think I get to do lots of webinars, and in non lockdown worlds, I get to go to conferences and talk, which is great. But the perk of that is that I get to listen to loads and loads of other people. So I used to be a special school teacher. And as a special school teacher, I accessed, you know, X number of training days a year. As a person who delivers training, I am the most trained person because I get to watch all the other seminars and things like this. And recently, I was at, I was virtually at a global event that was looking at inclusion of children with special educational needs and disabilities and the various presenters were giving their tips about it so I was on talking about sensory stories and sensory rooms and one of the other presenters said something that really kind of stuck in my head um, and they were describing uh, an inclusive drama performance type activity that you could do and teaching people how to do this and they said it's really important that no child is made to feel different and um, we don't want any child to feel like singled out, we don't want them to stand out. It's very important that no child is made to feel different. And I thought, well, that's really interesting, isn't it? Mm. Because that comes from an understanding of us as a social animal, that we must be in this herd in order to be safe. And in order to be in this herd, we must be one of the herd. So we must mm. identify, you know, all our markers must be that we are the same as you. I'm the same type of animal as you. I'm the same, we're safe, because we are, surviving as a social collective mm -hmm. <sighs> but that message it's really important that no child should be made to feel different that's got to do extraordinary harm hasn't it because every child is different every child is different and every child knows that they are different and all the while that we propagate a message of we've got to conform and appear the same we perpetuate the dangers that come with being different and those dangers are you know mental health difficulties where i you know somebody suffers from anxiety or somebody suffers from depression and feels set apart from the herd because they're now different or their skin color differences or their ability differences or their neuro differences or their race differences or their you know religious differences whatever the difference is in me that i feel sets me apart from the herd makes me feel in danger and other people's recognition of that difference, oh, not like us, weird, you know, sleeps with the wrong sort of people, has the wrong colour skin, puts me at danger. So what if we just flipped that starting message and said it is important that every child knows that they are different and that being different is a brilliant thing? That mm. would flip all of those minority narratives. When you meet something that's different, go, well, hey, this is interesting. You're not the same as me. I could learn something from this. Because it would be really boring to meet somebody who's exactly the same as me. And if that was the narrative that was going through our early education, then that would, you know, check a box for neurodivergence, but it would check all the minority boxes. So um, the, 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 the motto of the sensory projects is seeking to contribute to a future where people are understood in spite of their differences. So that, that would be my magic wand one, if you let me have it. I think that's that's really well put and um yeah points to I guess um issues with our current model of inclusion which is just put them all in a room everyone learns the same <laughs> everyone does everything the same they'll be fine everyone copes and I yeah. think one, one person does well out of that there's probably one person in the room for whom it suits and everybody else copes exactly exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> but celebrating differences that's absolutely it um 
And I just, yeah, and, and, a, and a question I wanted to ask is just finally, and I guess this isn't really the, the, the cherry on top, but I just wanted to learn a little bit more about um, the subtle spectrum, your your book that's coming out next next month. Um, oh, I'm curious gosh. what you want, what uh, what drew you to write it, um, what it says, what you hope it inspires. Um. Uh, so I'm autistic. I've been working professionally as a consultant in the field of special education for a, a decade as an independent and for another couple of decades you know employed by other people and I came out as autistic very very in a little way a few years ago when an organization called Parallel um, London who are now called Parallel Global asked me to be one of their ambassadors and they asked me to be an ambassador because I was there to represent people with profound and multiple learning disabilities. And I don't have profound and multiple learning disabilities. All of their other ambassadors had a disability of some description. I was the only non-disabled ambassador. They are a super inclusive organization. They are so accepting of difference. They are celebrating and promoting difference and diversity. And I thought, how wrong of me to accept being an ambassador but hide that I'm autistic. So I think on their web page it said, you know, Joe's autistic, but I didn't mention it anywhere else. And then um, last year, my son's book, here you go, product placement. Uh, my son's book was published, um, which puts me a lot further out there. And I've sort of known as somebody who writes books that there's a there's a book in this type of thing um and I'd done the research for it I've looked up that's why I know that quality of life paper is because I've read loads and loads of the research that's been done into autism um but to write a book is a really big deal and I didn't want to write it because my other books are all about sensory engagement work and my my professional work they're not about me much much more exposing to just write a book about me and so I had it in note form I was doing more I was like I need to do more research I need to I need to I need to do and I was reading um loads and loads of um blogs from other autistic people reading other autistic researchers just collecting this mass of information and going and people would say oh are you, are you gonna no no I haven't got the time I haven't got the time it you can't the you can't write a book without holding it all in your head in the first place to know where the different bits of it go. So the sort of start point is gathering up all the information and then you do this kind of mental thing where you locate it all. And then once you've worked out where it all goes, you can pick off a chunk and do that bit and do that bit. But I would say, no, I, I haven't got the time. It's too big a task. I can't, you know, I'm on a train on Thursday. I can't do it. And then of course lockdown hit and took away all the excuses. You're like, mm -hmm. oh, all right. So I just, have to sit at home now do I okay <laughs> so, so I wrote it but it's it's incredibly personal I've never been more terrified of a book coming out um I got a forward by Steve Silberman though the author of Neuro Tribes so I'm super mm -hmm. stuffed with that um and it is about um the there's a common landscape it would seem to people diagnosed in adulthood there's a common sort of set of you know like people talk about the stages of grief or um mm. of addiction there's there's these sort of set everybody has a very unique experience but there's a sort of common set of experiences there appears to be a common set of experiences to related to being diagnosed as autistic as an adult and it it looks at that journey that's common to everybody but does it through the lens of my um, personal experience. I'm, I'm so scared. No, nobody needs to buy it. It's fine. Just, just on a shelf and pass on by. You don't need to know that much about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be in the world. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, it's going to be fine. Oh, okay. Well, 
it was it was wonderful to to have this question and answer session with you, Joanna. Um, Thanks for having me back in. Yeah. Um, well, if we have any more questions from our audience uh, from the recorded, are we okay to send them over to you? And yeah. You yeah. Them? I'm online all the time. And is there are there any sort of social media channels you'd want to point um, anyone to? You meant you sort of referred to memes and and such during your talk. Is there anyone where you'd like people to find you? You can find me on Facebook and on Twitter and on LinkedIn, and I am super responsive. I'm a person on all three of those platforms. And if you visit www.thesensoryprojects.co.uk, you can find all those links under the contacts there. Oh, Be nice to make some new friends. Great. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again, Joanna. And, Thanks for having uh, me. And uh, take care on the podcast. Bye.